So I'm in the process of doing a diorama and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit, but I've got to build something on the order of six or eight uh, gondola cars. And they're all the same, but they're all different. This is kind of a blow up from Shorpy where I get a lot of these photos. These are all turn of the century gondola cars. And if you take a look at them, you've got a high side, you've got a low side, different heights here. And if you look at these two cars in the back, you can see they're actually hopper cars, whereas these are drop bottom gondolas. So I've got a whole bunch of different cars to make. And I really didn't want to have to scratch build each one individually. So over, so I got, so as in getting ready to do it, I started looking at dimensions and uh, Richard Brennan helped me. He took one of the Library of Congress photographs through Photoshop, kind of straightened it, came up with uh, car dimensions. Uh, we also found some other drawings, but even these two, you can see the stake pockets are different. The lengths are different. These things were all different. And I was trying to not have to, again, start from scratch on every one of these cars. So this is my new toy. I bought this over the summer. It's a filament printer, not you know the, the resin printer, but I wanted to see kind of what it would do. And I figured that gondolas would be a great place to start learning about 3D printing. So there's probably people on this call that know a lot more about 3D printing than I do. So uh, this is my experiments. I've probably learned more since starting this, but it's kind of where I was at the time. The nice thing about this printer is this platform actually is held on magnetically. When you 3D print, you want the print to adhere to the surface, and sometimes it's hard to get the 3D print off the surface. So this whole gold-colored piece actually pops right off, and you can flex it, and your print pops right off. And the surface is reversible, so this side is like a pebble texture. And if I would flip it over, it's a smooth side. And we'll talk about that in a bit on another slide. So, you know, when you start looking at 3D printing things, you say, can I print the entire car or not? I really didn't know what the limitations were of the printer. I didn't know how accurate it was. I didn't know what it could actually resolve. And when you start playing with the printer, there's things that the printer does and doesn't like to print. And we'll talk about that. Also, you know, the filament, which is, you know, the material that it extrudes, how, you know, is it workable? Can you sand it? Can you file it if there's a problem with it? And we'll talk a little bit about that also. So I kind of broke it up into the underframe, the deck, and the sides. So this is my one of my first drawings of the underframe. This is with Tinkercad. And I'm really happy with Tinkercad for doing these kind of things. The program is super easy to use. You come over here, you grab a shape like a square like this, drag it in, resize it, and then just bang, 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 duplicate it across there. And you've got all of your frame rails. The other thing Tinkercad like, lets you do is you can make your own shapes. So you see these truck bolsters. These are a shape that I made and saved in my own library and I can call them up and then reuse them later. The other nice thing with Tinkercad, if you wanna drill a hole like this, you grab this, which you see is kind of shaded, that's a hole. You move the hole where you want it, you resize it, you group it and you've got a hole drilled. So you guys have now had the intro to Tinkercad. That's 85% of what it takes to do things. There's some other little nuances, but it's super easy to use, uh, much better than SketchUp. And I know there's other programs similar, but again, this is really a fast way to do the drawing. So I did some other embellishments on the drawing since then. And here's my first print. And you know, it came out not too bad. One of the things I talked about is what does the printer like to do and not like to do? 
the printer likes to run continuous, you know, prints all around. I tried printing queen posts. I thought, what the heck, let's see what happens. And you can see there's all this stringing because what happens when it has to make an interrupted print, it actually stops, it retracts the filament a little bit to kind of break the, the run of filament and then restarts it. Well, sometimes it doesn't retract all the way. Sometimes it strings. And there's some things you can do to minimize that. I didn't sit down and play with it. And then there's videos on the web of how to do it. But again, I was just trying to print it. The other problem with the queen posts is there is a grain to this 3D printing. So nice long stretches like this are super strong, but you know, the printer putting little dots on top like this, it's kind of a, there's no grain there. They just pop right off. So when I tried to file them and clean them up, they broke off. So I just gave it up and said, I'll just use Titchy Queen Pose. So I went back into Tinkercad and modified the drawing. You can see I've got, you know, the holes in here for the Queen Pose. I've got my stake pockets. You can see this kind of shadowy box. Again, that's a hole before I merge the drawing so that I can fit a KD coupler box into the frame. I'd looked at printing the KD coupler box right in there too. And in talking to Fran Foley, he suggested I didn't because it's hard to get the dimensions good enough for everything to work right. And I'm kind of glad I didn't try to print those. So here's my revised print. And I'm pretty happy with it. You know, this is printed at 0.1 millimeter uh, layer height. So you can see there's a little bit of stair stepping on these bolsters, but that's fine. You know, I've got something that looks pretty much wood-like. And the thing that I like is I got the stake pockets printed onto the side of the car. And that was one of my worries when I looked at making all these cars is having to glue all these little microscopic stake, stake pockets onto the sides of the cars and then having them all pop off when I tried to jam the stakes in and put the cars together. So I'm really thrilled with this. And as Phil kind of was stealing my theme here, the thing that I like is this whole thing is super strong. I'm planning on actually running these cars and I was a little bit worried about a wood car and the whole thing kind of pulling apart or breaking apart. So, you know, it's one piece, you know, the truck screws screw right in the bolster. These screws for the couplers, there is actually 3D printed material under this coupler box. So the whole thing is super strong. It's flat, it's square. You know, it's kind of a good surface to work from. So I was happy with this. Uh, I have to drill out these holes. The holes aren't perfectly accurate, but I can drill them out for the queen posts and you know, everything just is working well. So I looked at printing the plant, the deck of the car. And this is that same print turned over, it's spray painted. You can see it's kind of pebbly looking. And this is the pebbly surface of that gold color plate I showed you on my uh, first slide about the printer. And if I would think about this being the, the deck surface, the pebbly stuff kind of doesn't look like wood. So I wasn't really happy about that. I could flip the, the platform over and print it so that it would be smooth, but then the smooth side kind of doesn't look like wood. I had to texture it a lot and I wasn't real thrilled about doing that. And I could also print a separate deck and then glue it on top. And there's some issues with that I'll talk about on the next slide. But if I, again, if I would want to put a, print this with the wood surface on top, you know, I have to make individual grooves, individual V grooves between the deck boards. And those grooves, when I experimented with it, didn't really print all that well. You know, when you put strip wood boards together, they have their own differences and everything. But when you 3D print, they all come out pretty much the same. I would also have to notch out for the stake pockets. I'd have to cut out for these drop doors. 
and it just seemed like odd hassle. So I just said, I'll just make them out of strip wood. I can do that quickly and I can notch out as I go for the, the stakes for the stake pockets, because as you know, deck boards, you know, extend past the edge of this frame. So this is what I alluded to when I talked about printing the deck by itself. This is just a little bracket. The printer, for some reason, likes to make random lines sometime. And you can see that I, there's these random print lines that come in as it moves back and forth. I don't know why it doesn't turn off the filament, but it extrudes these random lines. And then you also get this graining. You know, you can see individual print lines. There are some videos on the web about ways to minimize these kind of things and smoothing and this and that. But again, I didn't play with it. And I was just as happy making things out of wood. Hey, Earl, just as a yeah. side, if anyone's interested, I actually have a spreadsheet that you can use with your 3D printer to identify layers and direction orient them. So you could, for example, make those lines so they moved with the, the case and lined up linearly that way. So if anybody's right. interested, if you're printing, it takes about a minute to align the lines in your print on the top layers. Right, and that's what this note is here about layer controls. And again, this is a print bracket I did for somebody else and it just showed it really well. So now that I got the bottom and the deck figured out, I've got to print the sides. And, you know, the big question is, you know, what can a 3D, you know, filament home printer do? Can I actually print a scale two by something on edge? And I've got to print this vertically for this to work because you can see there's inside and outside corner plates. So you can't, print the sides flat because then you can't get the inside corner plates. So went back to Tinkercad and I thought, hey, this is great. I can just make a basic frame. I can add the corner plates with the little bolt heads on there. And then I can just stack them up and I can print an arbitrary sized or arbitrary height set of gondola sides. And I can also print, which shows up a little bit right there, is the platform for the brake wheel. So I thought, hey, this is great. Uh, let's see what I can do with it. So this is one of the first prints of that. And it actually prints a scale thickness two by at a, you know, this is two board height. Nothing gets distorted or bent. So I thought that was great. I had a put in the grooves between the boards, again, to separate the boards. And you can see, you know, sometimes they don't print all the way. And this is kind of the same problem with the flat deck boards. But yeah, this was okay, because it's gondola sides and they get crusty and all that. But you can see when I blew up the corner, again, this is where the corner plates are. You know, the corners are yucky. They're kind of an amorphous glob. And as I thought about it, I've got a competing technology, right? I've got, I want this, the boards to be smooth, but I want, I'm sorry, I want the, the boards to be textured, but I want the corner plates to be nice and smooth. So I can't get both of them. You had a question, David? You're muted. You're still muted, I think. There, thank you, Phil. Uh, let me yap here. I just wanted to check if you wanted to proceed through and we should save questions or whether you wanted questions during the presentation. I'm okay during the presentation. Thank you. Okay. So I kind of gave up on printing uh, these end things. Uh, I may go back and revisit printing the wood sides, but you know, making these out of wood really is, is pretty easy to do. And that's what I decided to do. But then I had to go and do something about making these inside and outside corner plates. So a while ago, I bought a whole ream of black printer paper, mostly for making tar paper roofs, you know, that I would overspray and then kind of sand them a little bit. Uh, so I took a piece of paper, sprayed it with Rust-Oleum color, you know, uh, rust-colored spray paint, 
and then cut a strip. This is actually a little L-shaped piece. It's a little bit hard to tell. The nice thing with using black construction paper on this is you don't have to touch up the cut ends. You know, if you think about doing this with white paper, you know, and you cut these things, you've got all these white edges that stick out like a sore thumb and it's a real pain in the butt to go ahead and kind of cover those over. So I just uh, put that L-shaped thing on my chopper and started chopping out a bunch of little corner plates. And once they were done, I could just sit there and glue them on the inside, the outside of the car. It's kind of a pain, but it goes pretty quick if you don't think about it too much. So this is the completed car. Uh, I've got a 3D printed underframe that I really like. I was able to glue the deck boards onto the 3D print with Eileen's tacky glue that worked well. And, which, and then that made it easy to glue all these other wood members on top of the deck as opposed to having different materials because the, uh, the filament stuff, you can't white glue, you have to super glue it. And also something I kind of alluded to before with the 3D printed material is it doesn't like to machine. You know, you can cut it with an X-Acto knife, it cuts pretty clean, but if you try to file it or sand it, it's kind of like trying to file Delrin, you know, where it kind of balls up and it rolls around the corner and it, it really doesn't like to be machined much after you print it. So again, I was happy with this other than my decal being a little bit off over here. Uh, one of the things that Jonathan and Phil and other people and Fran have talked about before with uh, 3D printing is you don't print material, you don't print models so much as you print tools. So I printed a couple little tools, a couple little squares to help me put this together. Uh, I left the top layers off of these two when I was printing just to see what would happen. This is like, you know, your visible 3D print and playing with different percentages of infill you know, these things aren't solid, they're honeycomb to save material. And you can see different levels of infill. And also you see, this is more of these random lines that I talked about that the, uh, the printer puts in there. So looking forward, I was pretty happy with my 3D print. I liked the underframe that I had. So I went and kind of cut it at a two thirds level and then just took this and rotated around to that. So now I've got a, a kit, if you will. I can take this and slide it into this one as much as I want and join it. And that gives me the individual length hopper cars. Because again, each of these hopper cars is different. Then I can get these bolsters and stuff, move them in, play with stake pocket spacing, move these over, join them up. And I can just bang, 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 start printing out these underframes. I do have one slide before I close out on sort of a different project here, completely different. Earl, before yeah. you do that, one thing I might be interested to do is the queen. What I've found is when you print thin cross sections vertically, yeah. So the heads printing up. For example, I did I did some O scale chairs. And the first time I printed the seat and I printed the front legs just coming straight up off the seat and they were, you know, a millimeter in diameter. So it turns out they're just these little spools of, of print going up and they're really fragile. Yep. What I found is I took those parts and I made them flat, same dimensions and laid them flat and they actually print really well. So one of the things that might be interesting is to turn the queen post 90 degrees and lay them flat and you may be able to print the rest of the queen post flat then. The Save green you. posts are okay. It's, yeah, yeah, but you know, I looked at, at doing that. But I'll tell you, the, the plastic injection molded queen posts from yeah. Fuji are so smooth. You yeah. know, and on a again, this is a filament printer. This is probably pushing the technology right. of what it's but, supposed to be doing. Right. Uh, all I'm saying is that things that vertically won't print when they print yeah. up out of the print, if you can turn them sideways so they print on the bed, the same yeah. dimension yeah. will be much stronger because it's going with the linear flow of the, 
right, of the you're output. Going, you're going with the grain of the material. Exactly. So. And again, but, I looked at that, but the detail wasn't going to be there. So uh, I went off great. to the injection molded. So I'm going to have one off. Yeah, or just a quick question. Um, I didn't quite catch it. Did you make, end up making the sides out of wood or did you print those? I tried printing. I didn't like the prints because of the corner posts or the corner plates. Right. So I went and made those out of strip wood. Okay, thanks. And that's what, uh, so I made the sides out of strip wood and then I could make the stakes out of strip wood and then kind of white glue all this together, which kept everything looking the same. If these would have been 3D printed, then I may have had to super glue or tacky glue this onto this. And then I was worried about things kind of not matching. All this stuff color-wise matches on here. Right, so how would you have finished the, uh, um, the 3D printed material to look like wood like you have here? So, this kind of looks like wood already. It has the wood grain. Right. And then what I do, what I would do is spray paint this Rust-Oleum camouflage to give it some kind of a tooth, a base. And then if you've seen some of my other clinics before, and if you know of Sierra West, uh, I use chalk. I use okay. chalk and alcohol. And you can kind of paint on the chalk right. with the alcohol and you would get close to this color. Actually, that's what this is down here, the frame. Mm -hmm. So this is sprayed with Rust-Oleum camouflage and then chalk. Then it looks pretty close to wood. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it does, it looks great. Thank you. How long did it take to print? Um, most things of this size take about an, at the 0.1 resolution, right? Which is the slowest print. It takes an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes, which isn't bad. You know, people look at that and say, oh my God, it takes forever. Well, you start the print, make sure it's started okay. And then you go away, do something, have dinner, come back and the print's done. You know, the nice thing about these also, this print uh, uses, I don't know, two or three meters of material. When you slice it, it tells you how many meters of material it's going to take. And if you look at the price of filament, you're talking six or seven cents per meter. So, you know, all these things are 30 cents or something. So you can make a lot of them, throw them away, and you're not really losing any money if you don't like the print. Earl, Dave Gibbons here. Yeah. Um, uh, something you might check, uh, I dealt with this in my work um, in digital representations of things, is something called aliasing. And you could have aliasing in the Tinkercad or aliasing in the way that the printer is handling the data. But mm -hmm. those lines, those little lines can actually be a representative of, of aliasing coming in and affecting the, the print. Those That's what I, I dealt with this in, in a totally different field, but it smells like that. And if you see any, it, you might look up aliasing and see whether you see anything. Okay. But I know a lot of it is stringing. And there's a guy, uh, he calls himself Filament Friday. I forget mm -hmm. the gentleman's name that I've been watching. And there's a lot of talk about this stringing and, you know, things you can do to minimize it. No, not to say. So I'm going to do my off-topic slide. Then I'll go back and close out the hopper car. So this is just something I just finished making. This was a little kit from Foscale Models. And I hate to use the word cute, but this is cute. I really like this. It's, it's sitting crooked because there's a wire coming out the back because there's lights under here and lights in here. But I thought this was just a neat little model to stick in the corner somewhere. So my kind of next steps on this printing project is I'm going to see if I can emboss some bolt heads on these corner plates to make them come out a little bit more like this. But at any reasonable distance, you don't see them on the car. I may or may not try playing with 3D printing the sides just for fun, but uh, I'm pretty happy with the 
I, stuff. I, I think this is where you get combined techniques. You just need to have a resin printer for the sides. Yeah. <laughs> I thought about a resin printer. Right. That's probably the next thing. But you know, the right. nice thing with the 3D with the filament printer is you fire it up, it prints, you come back, it's done. There's no smell. You don't have to clean it and wash it right. and mess yeah. with it. And, so, so Earl, this is great, great work. Um, Jonathan, by the way. Yeah. Um, so I'm assuming you used PLA uh, to print? That's correct. Yeah. So, so a material that I've started playing with and I'm beginning to like is there's wood-based filler filaments. And so it actually has wood particles in it and you can actually sand it and shape it a whole lot easier. And so that might be something worth looking into. You know, I saw it and I watched some videos on it and I, I was a little bit nervous about it because of the texture at this scale. But I, I understand what you're saying. I, I've seen that. It's, again, it's something on the list of things to... Uh, yeah, I, I, w I was playing with it or I'm playing with it, not because of what I wanted to get out of the texture, uh, more of it's potentially easier to shape and do some post processing on it. And that's what I've been kind of impressed with okay. is it's yeah, yeah, PLA is is yeah, you all you can do is really just cut it. You can't sand it. Yeah, you can. So the other things I need to do are you know, look at paint colors on these cars and then the fun thing, and I guess this is almost a segue into Dave's presentation, is each car has different decals and different lettering. So that's something else to, to work on. So this is maybe part one of about three or four parts as I work on this diorama. Uh, but this was you know, kind of the pacing item being able to build all these pieces of rolling stock. Earl, this is Dave Ackman here. Uh, I have also worked with uh, the wood impregnated PLA okay. when I was building some structures. And what I was uh, intrigued by was the fact that I could stain it with Minwax type stains. Oh, wow. I didn't realize you could stain it. Yeah, it worked out really nicely. Um, so so that's, a, that's a thought. Um, what did you pay for your uh, printer? 350 bucks, give or take. Okay, that's not bad. What slicer are you using? Cura. Cura. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's what I use as well. I paid about two fifty for an Ender Three Pro uh, about a year ago, and I've been just having a lot of fun with it. Uh, one other thing, you talked about tools. Uh, something I found useful again using Tinkercad is just drawing a rectangle, uh, and then drawing a rectangle hole, and rotating the one. And I've got an angle tool an angle measuring thing that's yeah. been kind of fun for me. Yeah, I had to make, I worked on a hopper car and I needed some 30 degree angle uh, templates. So I just banged it out of Tinkercad. You know, it's nice with Tinkercad, these little tools like this are easy to make, they're inexpensive and it's really just speeds up the model.